My role uh, this morning is to expand a little bit on what uh, Juliet uh, uh, said, uh, and uh, particularly uh, to focus on uh, the first two words of the theme, beyond learning, which I'm transformed now into a question. Do we need a theory of learning? Now, uh, uh, so, uh, after all, what is an anthropology of the education to be about? Uh, the, the question for me very often is an extremely practical one. Uh, once or twice a year or three times a year, some doctoral students who possibly should know better preparing her qualifi qualifying exams about two or three years into her doctoral works asked me, Professor Varen, what should be included in my bibliography on anthropology and education? Which is one of the three exams you should take. At that point, I scratched my head and said, you should, you should know. However, I, I respond that I expect students to be familiar with literature on two major and related issues, individual learning and social reproduction. And I add, she should also be aware of the recent critiques of the way these issues have been addressed. So, uh, now, how do I move? Ben? Oh, okay, thank you very much. Now, in which order? Ta-da, okay, so that seems to be working. Okay, good. thank you. Uh, so, we anthropologists inherit these issues from our founding grandparents, Margaret Mead and Pierre Bourdieu. And of course, I'm going to greatly simplify. Both Mead and Bourdieu use the word culture to cover what for one is wonder, a wonder about humanity, and I think for the other, a curse. So there is one of the many classical definitions of culture, and there are thousands of those. Uh, she optimistically, Margaret Mead, optimistically emphasized that human beings have an enormous potential to make an unimaginable range of particular ways of being, to speak different languages that keep changing, to take for granted matters that astonish other human beings, she was also convinced that becoming a particular person required much learning, precisely because no cultural norms, no cultural normal gets transmitted biologically. Bourdieu, pessimistically, emphasized uh, that what he called a cultural arbitrary requires hidden and violent mechanisms so that people eventually reproduce not only their own place in society or the place of others on whom they depend, they must also reproduce the mechanisms of the reproduction. Uh, Mead wrote about enculturation. Bourdieu, as we all know, wrote about the embodiment of an habitus. Both seem to assume that human beings are transformed by an imposition, often arbitrary, and both affirm that this political imposition causes a psychic state that it itself causes normal behavior for any particular place. Neither, as I read them, left much opening for wonder about the transformation of the normal. In classical anthropology, this wonder has sometimes been classified as concern for culture change, resistance, deep play, bricolage. Franz Boas himself wrote about innovation, borrowing, diffusion, so that in a recent anthropology, that concern with the vagaries of the normal and its imposition has led to a kind of revolt against the very concept of culture, as uh, uh, Julia Tolter mentioned earlier. So if culture is not cause, which I think we probably all agree with, uh, to, uh, nor an object to be reproduced through learning, then it's unclear that, I would say, whether it's, for me, it's clear that a major rationale for an, anthropo for an anthropology needing a theory of learning becomes moot. If people don't learn, then you don't need a theory of learning. Okay, uh, uh, keeping the normal uh, normal is very hard work and will ultimately fail. The normal does not reproduce. It involves, it evolves through human action. I dare even say that the arbitrariness of customs, languages, practices never completely disappear into various forms of the unconscious. In one way or another, arbitrariness always rises to various forms of practical consciousness. Two brief examples might clarify what I'm trying to say. Both involve controversy in the political imposition of an arbitrary practice. The first might have delighted Margaret Mead. I'm sure it would have delighted Lévi-Strauss. The second may have confounded Pierre Bourdieu. The first is a perhaps not so minor matter about a symbol and its peoples. 
So I'd like to tell a story about my wife and her daughter-in-law disagreeing about something that both thought was completely normal. Okay, so what does LOL transform into? So uh, uh, women of my wife's generations were quite sure that LOL stands for lots of love. <laughs> Their children or grandchildren are now generally sure that LOL stands for laughing out loud. When grandmothers and grandchildren now meet, the, then the arbitrariness of LOL stands out. What also stands out is the arbitrariness of the authority that is granted to the grandchildren to teach complaining grandmothers who obviously failed to teach and failed to assert their authority over their children and grandchildren. So uh, if you think this example is solely about laughing or love, consider an extremely consequential dispute that has not yet been resolved. In recent years, many parents have vociferously objected to changes proposed by those who imagined their authority could not be challenged, from billionaires to academics to federal and state administrators. On the matters of charter schools, high-stake testing, and trans examination, it is not blind acceptance of pedagogical authority that stands out, it's quite the reverse. As I have pondered these matters over the second part of my career as an anthropologist in a school of education, I've come to prefer a stance that can be well illustrated by two quotes. Uh, the first I discovered recently, I forget who brought it to me, by the famous American philosopher Charles Peirce. He has a very famous quote about pedagogy. In all the works on pedagogy that I've ever read, there have been bi many big and heavy. I don't remember any, that anyone has advocated a system of teaching by practical jokes, mostly cruel. That, however, describes the method our great teacher experienced. She says, open your mouth, shut your eyes, and I'll give you something to make you wise. And thereupon she keeps her promise and seems to take her pay in the fun of tormenting us. Okay, uh, experience, translated 100 years later, can be interpreted as our current conditions within what Jean Lave would call a community of practice. My take is that much of what happens in what I prefer to call polities is a matter of practical joking, sometimes cruel, but mostly the product of the very fact that the organization of any polity is a matter of some arbitrary development. Things are this way, things are not comfortable, Things could be different, but they are not. The normal is a pain at this moment for these people in these particular ways. Another version of the same argument is made by the French philosopher Jacques Rancière, whom you know I really like, and he wrote uh, something that goes against most of what we like to say. Language does not unite people. On the contrary, it is the arbitrariness of language that makes people try to communicate by forcing them to translate, but also puts them in a community of intelligence. So whatever you've learned is a problem. This appears in a book that is a radical challenge to most of what we must do at Teachers College. The book is entitled The Ignorant Schoolmaster, and it is first a strong argument that most of what we have to learn, we learn from people who do not know that we are which we are learning. Those who do not know how to read can get others to learn how to read. In this, those who do not know how to read can teach themselves how to do it. When Ray McDermott gave me Rancière's book, he warned me that there was no ethnography in the book, that I would like it and there would be no ethnography. Just have to be careful. Uh, Rancière, of course, was making an intellectual, actually a moral critique of those who, since Plato, have argued that only publicly acknowledged experts may teach and that they may only teach their own expertise. Uh, I'm very happy that in the past decade, many wonderful students and colleagues have provided much of the ethnographic evidence 
Forencier's argument. And whether it's mother of autistic uh, children, mothers who take care of uh, mothers uh, across uh, national boundaries, even venture capitalists, uh, um, to uh, say that we are not simply, uh, we are very broad-minded, not to mention to do-it-yourself biology labs, et cetera, et cetera. The, the ignorant teach themselves, or they bother those who learn. Anyway, and then they deal with what others make for them. What has emerged is that the work of all these people, whether play or resistance, has a central pedagogical ex, uh, aspect. For those of you who know Garfinkel, it's probably what's called a tutorial problem. But it's, it has a pedagogical aspect. When Rancière writes about communities of intelligence facing the problem that a joint language produce, he insists that he's not opposing two forms of knowledge, that of the people and that of the experts, or two forms of intelligence. On the contrary, he insists that in all cases it is a question, and I think this is up there, uh, of observing, comparing, and combining, of making and noticing how one does it. Uh, I have added, in my own writing, I've added that these analytic acts always takes place among a collectivity assembled for the purpose of analyzing, comparing, combining, convincing, institutionalizing, and so on. So uh, I have written about difficult deliberations to try to uh, emphasize, not simply, I don't really like the word negotiation, deliberation, I'm, because negotiations seem to have an end, and deliberation do not have quite an end, end in to any kind of consensus. But you said you might, because they, they might end with an affirmation of authority. That's what I said. Bringing out this deliberation, bringing out, uh, so that, okay, so the deliberation always involves methods for convincing others, that's the pedagogical part, methods that can be also violent. Uh, bringing out these deliberations about the normal is a task, I would argue, for a renewed anthropology of education. In that anthropology, the issue would not be learning. The issue would be following people as they figure out what to learn, what to teach, who to teach it to, and what pedagogy to use. There are classical issues that in Europe and America were given to specialists in this institution. But they are actually, and by all evidence, issues for all human beings, and perhaps most for non-specialists, as they attempt to figure out what to do with what the specialists are proposing. And from what I just discovered about uh, charter schools in New Orleans, the first task of a parent in New Orleans is trying to sort out what is the organization of charter schools in New Orleans. So even schools have to be learned about by people who do not know about schools, ignorant schoolmasters but very important ones. So these are the concerns who led me to propose that our theme for this second conference should be about innovation, design, new normals. I'm glad that so many responded to our call for papers, and I'm sure we will be debating, uh, and that many will leave still convinced that anthropology about education needs a learning theory. And I've never succeeded in, in uh, convincing either Jean Lave or Ray McDermott that they should not be considered themselves interested in learning theories. So I know that you will remain unconvinced. But this is just the, one to, the point I want to make. Anthropology, like any other human activity, is not a matter of hidden contract and consensus. It is a matter of dealing with any normal that we inherit from grandparents, even grandparents as powerful as Margaret Mead and Pierre Bourdieu. Our task is to challenge our inheritance and propose new designs for our work. So. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Amy Stambach at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Professor Stambach is the Villas Distinguished Professor of Anthropology there. She's famous in our world and, and that of comparative education for her work on education in, in East Africa, the place of evangelical Protestantism there. And recently she has been writing about the encounters of China and America in US universities. Uh, today she will address us on old schools, new times, and innovation over after the internet. Thank you. Okay.